Hello, Mosa community. It is Shamika and I am back. And today we're going to be talking about my NOSA office hours. So I do bi weekly office hours with me of the of the NOSA group. And um, I just wanted to share it here on YouTube. We're having some technical difficulties, so I didn't quite get started at 12.30 as anticipated, but we're going to go ahead and get going. We're going to kind of keep the process moving along. Um, we want to give you guys the opportunity to ask any questions. And I'm going to start answering. I'll start in December, but I'm going to start answering some of the frequently asked questions from NOSA members, right? So are more popular questions from NOSA members. And typically the way the office hours works is there's either a question in the group or a couple of questions in the group that I want to address here via live. And then people get the opportunity to jump in like you guys and ask questions as well. So we're going to do that today for about an hour. So if you are here on the live, feel free to jump in and check us out. Um, we have a amazing, what did I say amazing? I mean, amazing growing community on Facebook and we're looking to grow that same community with more people onto YouTube. So that's primarily why you see me hanging out here in my little space um, so that you guys can get to know me and start spending some more time with me. So. As I mentioned, office hours are bi-weekly on Wednesday. I'll save the link here in the comment section if you want to jump in. They are usually via just Zoom, but today I wanted to do some stuff on YouTube, so I figured why not? So some of the most popular questions happening in this month are around payroll funding. So a lot of people have questions about like, what is it? Why do people use it? You know, what's the benefit of it? And honestly, Payroll funding or really back office um, professional employer organizations have been around for a long time. And there is a difference between payroll funding, right, and back offices or professional employer organizations. So I'm going to keep it really lightweight with you guys and just say, hey, the main difference is that in a back office or a professional employer organization, they typically offer payroll funding. But payroll funding is exactly what it sounds like. It's also been called invoice factoring. Um, it has a couple of different names, but it's around paying your invoice or your payroll um, to you ahead of it actually being paid. Of course, with the exchange that you know the hours are invoiced to the client, and the client then pays the payroll company, and then they take a percentage and give you the rest. So. There's a lot of information probably on YouTube and other platforms about it. I'm not going to get too much into it because that's not my area of expertise, but more around why as a healthcare staffing agency owner, it could be a benefit or it could be a hurdle. So of course, with any industry, whether it's healthcare or staffing in general in any arena, when you add services or products to your business, there's always a fee involved. So one of the things that I encourage people to take into consideration is that, hey, do I need to pay the fee in order to add technology or add a service, or could I bring a person in-house? I do believe that there are certain roles or key roles that should be done in-house. It's just a preference of mine but not exploring as a agency owner newer or having been in the business for some time the pros and cons of having someone in-house versus outsourcing it really could be a detriment to your future of your business because you may not know what you're missing right i recently talked with anosa and she said which i think so many other notes would agree with is you don't know what you don't know so with back offices a lot of the roles that they play in addition to payroll funding is they also do a lot of your human resources and compliance management activities. And those are usually in your larger corporations or medium sized corporations are things that are kept in house and a big part of it is because it's just more costly so a professional employer organization or 
those types of companies really are set up to benefit medium to small size businesses just because there are more processes in place to do it in-house like at a or outsource like at a um eo abc then it may be for you to bring an individual in but I encourage people to at least explore the fact that bringing an individual to process human resources, compliance, paperwork, onboarding types of jobs um, are not as costly as you think, because you have to think about it in this regard. Whether you outsource it to a back office or do it in-house, both individuals typically, probably now more so than before, are going to use a system. They're going to use an ADP system or some sort of human resources information system or management system or applicant tracking system. There's no way of doing the work without these systems. When people bring it in-house, you need a system. When you outsource, they're using a system as well. Um, so the same thing applies with compliance. So a big part of the human resources role in healthcare staffing is around compliance. Same thing. Very few companies are doing their own background investigations. They are outsourcing it either to a system or to an individual who uses a system where you input the information and you get a result. Um, same thing with drug screening. You put it into a system, whether it's LabCorp or Quest, or if it's a bundle you know, program that includes LabCorp and Quest or Concentra, and then you get an outcome at the end once the person goes and takes the test. So um, a bigger part of even considering bringing it in-house or outsourcing it to a company is the manpower. So cost is one factor, but manpower is definitely another factor in making sure that you're finding someone with who meets the right fit. So finding an experienced person to do that isn't as big of a challenge as it might be to make sure that that person is a good fit for your business. As small business owners, many times we run into challenges around the fact that we don't have enormous budgets or we may not have um, access to a lot of resources and systems, especially early on. But I encourage people to think about, is there areas where you can bundle your system? So if I'm using, for example, if I'm using like QuickBooks for my payroll and my accounting, well, is it better for me to also use QuickBooks for my scheduling or T-Sheets, which is an extension of QuickBooks, or should I just bring all of that, um, you know, bring pieces of that into one system or have, you know, elements of it in another system? So kind of deciding what makes sense from a financial standpoint of view is really key, as well as a functional. So for some of us, myself included, you don't want to have to go into five different systems. But you also have to understand that there is value in having a couple of different systems because that really allows you to have like if it's say it's T sheets, for example, and I say oh I don't want to use your scheduling APP. I want to use a separate company like connect teams, then if connect teams is more efficient in the scheduling and has really perfected it. In that in that example it's better to use a separate scheduling system, but look to see if that scheduling system has any sort of interface or any sort of link where the information that you're housing there can be put over to QuickBooks where you're running your payroll. So those are different ways that you can accomplish similar tasks that a lot of back offices do without it being as time consuming. And the person that typically is able to do those tasks doesn't have to be a person who's an accountant. It can be a bookkeeper. It could be someone who has accounting experience. So I wouldn't always focus on someone at the top tier of their level as much as making sure that you have an understanding. So if I say, hey, these are the three roles that typical back offices do, human resources, compliance, and payroll, you don't have to get people who have CPAs or um, certifications to do it. It's not a bad idea. But that doesn't have to be the focus as much as you need to have an understanding of what they need to complete from A to Z so that when they're doing it, if at the point you're the business operations manager or part of your role as a CEO is business operations, you can make sure that it's being done correctly. Um, 
So that was one of the questions. And as I promised, guys, I am going to do a second video on that, just more specifically talking on that. But that's a big question in the group, mostly because a lot of times professional employer organizations take quite a substantial part of your profits. And um, not realizing that those monies over time, right? So if I'm using a professional employer organization over time could actually be put together in a salary for a part-time human resources or part-time payroll individual. So I encourage people in the presentation I'll do later to really think through, hey, do I need a person or do I need technology or do I need both? And do I have a clear understanding of what it is and why it's important to my organization? So, all right, so I'm gonna jump over and see if we have any questions in the chat. Um, but that was one of the um, common questions coming out this past week. So let's see. Okay. So let's see if we have any questions in the chat. Looks like no. Um, so we're going to keep it moving <laughs> as usual. So we're going to keep it moving. Um, and I'm going to go to another commonly asked question. So the next commonly asked question is around post COVID. So that's a really great question because what do things look like post COVID? Like, what do you guys think? Um, I'm excited in a lot of ways to see what it looks like more from a change perspective. Um, I think, and these are all my opinions. Um, that COVID really opened the doors to some inefficiencies um, that might be existing in our industry. So it's always nice to see, you know, a problem be identified and that there be a potential solution um, on the way. So I think that that's important as well, that hopefully there'll be more solutions to some of the problems, some of the care gaps, some of the inefficiencies that our industry is facing so that it can really allow us to just do better. You know, being able to do things differently, you know, as things, as, as the time moves forward is really important. You know, we all wanna be able to kind of learn from experiences. And I think for myself and a lot of people that have been a part or in the mix of, COVID-19, whether it be on the front lines or had, you know, people be more personally impacted by it, knowing that we had this experience and we would go back to business as usual doesn't quite work. So um, hopefully that'll change um, as we go into 2022. As always, I encourage people to stay safe, you know, be smart about it. Um, the news isn't covering it in the same way it did a year ago, but that doesn't mean that it's gone away. So um, definitely think through those types of things. Um, one of the things, and this is the third question um, I'm gonna touch on, that the whole COVID-19 um, experience has really, really opened eyes to is the fact that there are some opportunities for technology. So um, a big part of technology plays a role in healthcare, but not in the way that most people think. And just like many other industries, I think healthcare staffing has been very, very slow to incorporate technology into what it is that we do on a regular basis. So one of the questions I saw in the group and on Facebook was around, could technology have solved some of the shortages that we saw in healthcare staffing during kind of the height of the pandemic? And that's a good question because then it becomes an opportunity to really look at what's wrong with healthcare staffing in the way that we have traditionally done it. You know, why does certain things make sense versus certain things don't make sense anymore? Um, one of the things that I think is something that needs to get looked at, and it's a lot of things that I think need to be looked at, is around um, the compliance and credentialing process. Um, I if you don't know, I don't think I introduced myself, but I have an intro in my bio. Don't forget to like and subscribe um, to our channel, but I'm a second career nurse. So my first career was actually in human resources. So 
part of some of my perspective and how I see and view things is based on other industries, which I think is a nice added value. But with that being the case, I also see where the healthcare industry has some gaps um, beyond just care. And in my opinion, one of the gaps is in the compliance and credentialing process, like the process to onboard applicants is cumbersome, but I don't know that it's necessary um, because every license holder is managed at the state level. And shout out, I'm gonna side note it, shout out to New Jersey for coming, becoming a part of the nurse licensure compact. Ooh, I'm excited. I sit right between New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Maryland. So I'm excited. Um, and that's definitely one of the ways and strides that we can take to allow nurses to work across state lines so that you don't have to get an application and go through that whole application process and payment in every single state. So if you haven't, check it out. New Jersey, I want to say it was the beginning of this week, recently signed all the paperwork to become an official part of the Nurse Licensure Compact. I'm not going to get into what the Nurse Licensure Compact is, but I'll leave a link here if you want to find out more information about it um, and how it benefits healthcare staffing agencies and really the healthcare industry as a whole. So um, I was really talking about tech. So the compliance process and the credentialing process is from a nurse perspective, it's been the same for the last decade. And what I think we saw in COVID was that there were opportunities to take shortcuts in an emergency. But I also feel like, could those things be things that we eliminate from the process? Does a nurse or, and I'm just really speaking about nurses, um, but I think it applies to other roles in healthcare. Do you need to submit all that documentation to start working? Is it necessary? Um, have we determined or why did we determine it's necessary whenever that was? And then is it still something that's necessary as we go into 2022? So I'm excited, as I've mentioned, into the group and with you guys to see what technology will bring um, as the industry continues to be and have quite a few disruptions. I'm hoping that technology will be one of those things that is included in that process and those conversations um, that people are having when we're talking about staffing into 2022. I hope to be a part of it. That's one of the themes for the NOSA group as we go into 2022 is the tech of it all. And not only how we can be more productive as business owners, but also from a perspective of healthcare staffing professionals, you know, are we looking at areas that we can improve upon and offer options, you know, to make our industry just more seamless, um, more effective, and um, more prepared, you know, as many people have said, <laughs> this will happen again. And I would love if I'm around when it happens again, that we actually do an amazing job at it. Um, and this I'm referring to another pandemic and not be in a place where we're scrambling in the way that we were over the last two years. So that's that. So um, it's about 1258. So I'm going to keep rolling in the group. Actually, I'm going to bring up some questions because those are the top three questions. And then I'm gonna to touch a little bit on some questions about the process of getting started. Um, so give me a hot minute and um, kind of our direction as we move into 2022. So, um, uh, okay. So this is another question that I see in the group often about making the transition from being a nurse, a CNA, or healthcare professional. So our group is open to everyone. I will say 90% of our group is healthcare professionals. So lab techs, sonographers, ultrasound techs, physical therapists, occupational therapists, nurses, registered nurse, licensed practical nurse, certified nursing assistants, and then non 
healthcare professionals. So we do have a plethora of people in our community. I love to see the community grow. There's opportunity for everybody and there is really a chance for everybody to sit at the table. So I'm gonna touch on two more topics and then I'm gonna wrap up with you guys. Um, and hopefully, probably I'll do another one of these um, YouTube lives, but more than likely it'll be a different topic. It won't be this um, office hours topic. So. The other question is around getting started and mindset. So kind of making that transition from employee to employer. And you know what that takes, what that looks like, why it matters that you do the transition and some hiccups. So I recently did a video here on YouTube actually about the five mistakes that individuals make in making that transition. But I'm not going to touch too much on the mistakes as much as the process of kind of changing your mindset. So a couple of things you want to remember when you're making that transition and you're kind of talking through the idea of getting started and what that looks like is when I think about business related things, am I thinking about it from a perspective of an employee? Which is cool because that's where most of us start or an employer. And mostly the reason I mention it is because the needs and the wants and the intentions of an employee is very, very different than those of an employer. And many times we found ourselves, myself included, stuck somewhere in the middle where on issues where it is very clear and black and white, we end up straddling the fence. So changing your mindset and what's important and what's going to help your business grow you know, what's going to create the foundation you want for your business, the messaging that you want out there, the experience that you want to give your employees is heavily, heavily based in your mindset. And a big part of mindset um, that I even had to revamp in my own experience is around goal setting. So if you're not the type of person who sits down and sets goals for the year or the month, you will struggle in any business, not just this. Because part of businesses, especially within healthcare, is results. So if you're not setting goals, how are you knowing that you're hitting your results? How are you knowing that you're getting your expected outcome? So really getting into the habit of doing that, especially for those who are starting out this year, is really key. Because then you can say, hey, when I looked back at the beginning of January 2021 and I wanted to do these five different things, I looked. I wrote it down. And then now that it's November, almost December, I can say I did that, you know. Um, and it doesn't have to be um, everything written at the same time, but it can be bigger goals that are broken down into monthly and weekly goals. It can be like, a, uh, you know, a goal that you add, add to over time. It can be a big goal for the end of the year that you kind of work up throughout the year so that you're doing and hitting different you know, milestones throughout the year. So it can look a couple of different ways. And as we already know, there's so many books out there on it, but not doing it matters. Um, the second thing is accountability partner. So, so many people ask me, well, Shemika, you know, do you have an accountability partner? How are you able to do so many different things and manage it all? I do. <laughs> and I usually meet with my accountability partner um, bi-weekly, and it helps me with making sure that my business is going in the direction that I want to. Sometimes as new business owners, we can get ourselves pulled in many different directions or even just kind of be open to and excited about so many different opportunities. But one of the things that I really focus on, because I think my word for this year is mindfulness, is to focus on one thing at a time and perfect it. Um, doing that really adds value into your ultimate goal and it makes it so much easier to duplicate. So mindfulness was my word of the year. So that's one of the things that I do. I'm working on mine. I hope you guys are working on your word of the year. And from that word then becomes what I plan to achieve as far as like an ultimate goal. Um, and then there's of course subcategories under that. So having someone hold you accountable to that, having someone not only, you know, check in with you, but, you know, encourage you and support you, help you brainstorm and come up with ideas 
is amazing. And I encourage you, if you don't have one, to get an accountability partner. The person doesn't have to be in the same industry that you're in, and they also don't have to be doing the same thing that you're doing. I've found that having some similarity matters, but I work well with people really who have the same mindset more than people who are doing exactly what I do. Um, the third thing is what I already said, staying focused. You have to be able to stay focused on the task or the task at hand. Um, being able to be pulled in many different directions or what some people call multitasking in many, 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 many regards is ineffective. Um, I probably this half part of the year, probably in the summer, really honed in on this because it was something that I do. I call myself a multitasker, but I have realized from a business perspective, it's ineffective. And one of the ways that it, I help myself with managing the fact that I do multitask is hiring help. So asking for help is gonna be the fourth one. So um, hiring help helped me give someone else a task that I do that are repetitive, allows me to focus on the more income producing tasks that um, allow me to move closer towards meeting my ultimate goal. Us working together creates the best collaboration. Adding in my accountability partner helps me stay on track. And then we're December 31st and we're out here doing the things that we intended to do January 1 of 2021. So um, the last part, the fourth one is asking for help. So asking for help doesn't always have to be what I did, which is hire a virtual assistant. Um, I haven't, I've had a lot of virtual assistants before this one. Um, understanding how virtual assistants work and how they can work for you and work for your business is really important, as well as how to work with them. So of course, virtual assistants, you know, sometimes they work in different time zones, depending on how you have that set up. But for me, it was really key to work with someone that was a addition, someone who could easily fill in the gaps where I struggled. Um, I'm one of those people where I do many things. I can learn easily. I'm a quick learner. But there were areas in my business that I struggled. So bringing in someone who was comfortable and confident in that area was really where I wanted to focus on as we went into the summer months. And I did just that. So I was super excited. And then also, which a lot of people definitely invest in, help can be like a one time help. It could be a coach or it could be a course. So both of those things I have done before I support, I think. YouTube University is great. I also think that something more in depth from someone maybe that you've been introduced through YouTube University is even better. And it doesn't always have to be a one-to-one. -one. It could be a self-paced course. It could be a 30-minute coaching. It could be group coaching. It could be a digital download document. So look at all those ways to educate yourself in business not so much healthcare staffing, but in business processes, workflows, and things like that, that'll really reap the benefit of your business over time. And then the last thing, because I like to do things in five, is your attitude. You know, part of what I started four years ago with creating the NOSA group was this was an idea. It was an idea that I felt, hey, is there anybody else out there who was a nurse who owned a staffing agency or was interested in it? Can we work together to kind of unpack this maze? You know, I was hitting a lot of walls of no, I don't know, I can't help to understand how to jump into the industry. So I wanted to connect with other people, much like many other Facebook groups do, as well as YouTube does. So, um, you know, connecting with that right community, supporting that right community, having the right people in place. You know, those are all things um, that matter as well. And um, taking risk. So being able to step out and just really say, hey, I think it's a good idea. Not every time is everybody gonna buy into what you have a vision for or a desire for. But if you have enough faith and belief in it, it can happen. Like I said, I started with an idea and I shared in the group that the, there was only one person um, that I knew on Facebook that I could add to the group. 
And that one person has been the first person in the group because when you start groups, you always have to add people. And that person has been supportive throughout the whole journey. So it doesn't have to be complicated. You know, it doesn't have to be, hey, I have to have all the answers right now. You know, there's our instances where you need that, but that's not every instance. So um, 4,000 members later, you know, we're in a much, much better place. And there's definitely way more people that are in that mindset as well as um, opportunities for them to grow. So, all right, so it's 110. I'm gonna do one last check and we're gonna wrap this up. It has been kind of cool hanging out with you guys. I'm gonna have to do this again soon. Let's plan for December, see where we end up. <laughs> um, so it looks like we don't have any questions. We got a couple people watching, but we're gonna keep moving all right along and wrap it up with the um, last question. So I'm gonna take a quick look at the last question and then we're going to wrap it up and then let's you know, see if we can do it again in December. Let's see. Okay, so I have the last question. This question actually did really, really good in the group. So it's a perfect question. And I'm not gonna drop out the whole scenario. If you're not in the group, click over here, join our Facebook group. But it's about um, acknowledging your mistakes and doing better. So, one of the questions was around um, one of the nurses who had had a situation, which we all have, um, at a facility with a staff member and kind of how to circle back when a staff member isn't happy about either the experience or what might be happening. So throughout the process, um, there had been some back and forth and the staff member decided, you know, hey, I'm gonna just leave the facility. So there was a ton of feedback on that. And one of the things that I shared kind of in the comments about what I would do is how you approach difficult situations. So a uh, wrap up of all, all the text that was in it was around how you approach difficult situations. So I did tell the person who posted that I would have handled it a little bit differently because part of it is what I talked about earlier, your mindset, you know, the things that mattered or, you know, the things that had implications before may or may not have those same implications on the other side. In the same way that, um, and I'll circle back guys, when you do a bill rate and you don't include an overtime bill rate, you can't then ask the facility to pay you overtime when you haven't included it in your contract. So that's a mindset because as an employer, you do have to pay your employees overtime, but your client may not have to pay an overtime bill rate if you don't include it in your contract. So dealing with difficult situations or difficult people was kind of the overview of that conversation. And there are always a couple of things to consider when dealing in those matters is getting a clear picture of what happened. So you always want to allow the employees the opportunity to tell you what happened from their perspective, but you always want to follow up a little bit further or go a little bit deeper to understand maybe some other variables that they didn't include or may have impacted how the situation had its ultimate outcome. The other thing is you want to think about repercussions and um, outcomes from a business perspective. So employees leaving a site or doing no call, no show or something like that has a impact on the client, you know, no sub relationship. So that's something that you always wanna minimize. So the best way to minimize that is to set expectations with your employees and set opportunities for them to meet their intended goals as well as communicate with you so i always encourage people and if you aren't doing that in your notes to watching do your employee surveys anonymously with your employees now because just in case you didn't know this is the time of year where people really do their own personal self-assessment they assess their business they self their personal life their professional life and as we go into january is when people start to make the change 
So don't set yourself up in a way that you haven't had a conversation. You have an employee who seems like they're happy because they're, you know, picking up shit, picking up contracts, and then all of a sudden decides to no longer work with you because, you know, they're, you're sending them to a facility that they don't like or they're having bad experiences at other places or they want more pay or more benefits or what have you. So I encourage you to have that conversation now. And then the other piece you want to think about, is there any legal ramifications for how you react to the situation? So just like with nursing, you always want to CYA, you always want to make sure that you're documenting things. It kind of applies on the flip side as well. So as employers, you want to document everything. You want to communicate along the process. You want to make sure that you know, you've done your due diligence with the facility, with any supervisors or DONs or things of that nature, and, you know, had an opportunity to do a final communication with the employee. Not doing so could be of a negative outcome. Um, and you also want to understand that it's never personal. For me, that wasn't a hard fix or something hard to transition into because, like I said, I worked in human resources. So, I've seen it all, <laughs> but I think as nurses or healthcare professionals transition to being employers, some of it feels personal. Some of the actions or reactions or the communications many times feels like they're personally targeting you, when in actuality, they could very well be the type of individual that does that to everyone. And um, Honestly, it doesn't matter if they are or aren't. So if they maybe did it to you on purpose or didn't, your response to it needs to every single time be the same. Every single time communicate the same. Every single time get certain things in writing or get certain things documented. You know, do emails versus text messages um, because that's a better tracking process, you know. You know, do trainings now, you know, reiterate, you know, your chain of command, your organizational structure, how people can, how people are supposed to call out, how people can stay compliant, you know, how people are supposed to pick up shifts. You want to always include that in your regular communications with your employees in a formal and informal way. So I know our industry is heavily taxed. That's fine. But you also have to understand that there is no guarantee that people are receiving text messages. So I would encourage people to also email because you can track email a little bit better in a way that you may not always be able to track text messages. And it just formalizes whatever it is that you're trying to do. So um, in that scenario, we got a lot of feedback. The person that posted it, you know, gave us the outcome because that's always nice to know in different scenarios what the outcome of the situation was where the person was asking for advice or feedback and, you know, learn something she can do differently, you know, learn something that he or she can do differently, which is also part of that growth process. You know, your first year, your first 18 months is very much trial and error. Now, it shouldn't be on every element of your business, but it is trial and error because you are transitioning your role. So, you know, make sure that you give yourself some patience and leeway with that. We all make mistakes. We all have flub buffles and um, say the wrong thing. You just want to make sure that having the support system, having the goals, having the accountability partner, asking for help is part of what you do on a regular basis so that when you end up in some of those places where you feel a little bit stuck, you don't stay there because that's when it becomes harmful in that you'll begin to repeat the same things and um, you know, end up having more um, negative or more severe um, outcomes from it. So as always, thanks for hanging out with me today. Again, I'm gonna introduce myself because I think I missed that today. I was so excited to jump on YouTube Live. My name is Shamika. I am the founder and creator of the NOSA Group, the Nurse Owned Staffing Agency. We are four, thousand members strong representing all of the United States. Super excited about it. Our group not only has nurses, but we have CNAs, CMAs, um, occupational and physical therapists, lab techs, ultrasound techs, sonographers. So we're open to everybody. Um, I'm excited to have our community really grow this past year leaps and bounds. 
Um, I want to say we started the year at about 2,000 members or 2,500 members. So we definitely had a great leap. There is a lot of opportunity in healthcare staffing industry. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. But part of what the community offers is an opportunity to unmask, unveil some of the things that people didn't know before about how the industry works on the inside. You get a great group of supporters and potential accountability partners or even business partners, guys. In the group, we share information um, to each other because just like with nursing, every state is a little bit different. So unfortunately, um, healthcare staffing, even though it's not a hard industry to get into, is not the same state by state, just because the state rules and regulations change are a little bit different. So if you are interested, definitely feel free to check out my video. I think the videos are down here about how to get started. Check out that video. We have videos that talk about vendor management systems. They're becoming a bigger thing in our industry. Um, as we go into 2022, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the IT of it all, the tech of it all, and how we as agency owners and healthcare professionals can really tap into technology and the way that we do our business and the way that we run our business or even start our business and why it's important. And we have an amazing group of healthcare partners who help me do what it is that I'm doing here, who support you know, the mission and vision of the NOSA group, as well as provide products and services for us as small business owners to thrive in a demanding industry. So as always, thanks for hanging out with me. Check us out here on Facebook. We're on Instagram, we're of course here on YouTube, as well as feel free to check out our website listed below and get some more information about other services. Thanks as always. I hope you guys have an amazing holiday.